Hello everyone and welcome to the Storytellers podcast. In this episode I have the pleasure of talking to another old chemistry lecturer of mine, a man by the name of Christopher Thompson. Now Chris is both a chemist and a researcher with an avid interest in education and education research, which is the reason why I chose to speak to him. He was well renowned at my university and through my classes for being an excellent educator and referred to more so as a teacher rather than a lecturer, which is an important distinction, I think, and one that we cover in the episode. So Chris and I cover a few topics related to university. We talk about the role that universities are supposed to play. We talk about the nature of being a student and the sort of interaction between student body and university structure. And we also talk about the failings, in particular some of the failings of universities and the university system and what perhaps could be done better. All in the all with the hope that such discussions and topics will raise perhaps if not solutions to those answers then will further the the interesting conversation around that space. So it was a great conversation and I loved it and I hope that you all will too. So without further ado I give you Chris Thompson. Okay, so today I have the pleasure of talking to Chris Thompson. So Chris was an associate professor of, and correct me there if it's was or or is, is still an associate professor or... Well, no, I'm, I'm formally, I'm not currently an associate professor as of, yeah, a few weeks ago. Okay. But. Okay, so Chris Chris was an associate professor of chemistry at Monash University and also served as the associate dean of education. So beyond a research interest in chemistry, he's focused on inquiry-based and problem-based learning, representations in chemistry, active learning, and alternate strategies in chemistry, and graduate employability. So Chris, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. Great to be here. Awesome. So just thinking to get us get us started, to kick us off, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are and how you ended up doing the things that, you, that you've been doing. Sure. Well, look, I start by saying there were, there were times over the last few years where I, I felt like I had to pinch myself sometimes to, to acknowledge how my career had somehow gone okay because, um, you know, I had, I had a pretty good time at university. At, at, there were periods of time where I, where I took intermission, so I just dropped out of uni for a while just to do other things like playing a rock band and, and those sorts of things. You know, I've always played in bands and so on. But, um, you know, it's fair to say there were times in my early 20s where I, was, I wasn't even sure I was going to get through my, um, my course at uni. Um, and but, that, that was, uh, chem- was that chemistry? At uni? Yeah, I, I was at the ANU at, in Canberra. So I grew up in Albury and um, finished high school in Albury, which, if anyone listening doesn't mm-hmm. know, is on the coast of, uh, not the coast, the border of um, New South Wales and Victoria, on the New South Wales side. So a bit of a country town, a bit of a country boy. and, uh, and then common, um, and, common common area for students to come uh, come from, from into, into Monash and Halls in particular. I had lots of friends from Albury and Wodonga. Yeah, yeah. So you know, a lot of a lot of kids from Albury Wodonga, they they go to, um, you know, they go to the big cities to go to university, um, and actually quite a lot go to Canberra. I think in some ways for country kids, you know, Canberra is a good halfway point because you know it's the capital city, but it's it's still like a country town in some ways. Mm. Um, in fact, Canberra is a very unusual place um, for for all sorts of reasons. But uh, but it was a great place to go to uni, and uh, and so I did a, an arts science double degree. Um, mm. I was interested in Chinese language uh, when I was young. I had been an exchange student when I was uh, 15, 16 um, in Hong Kong for 12 months uh, where I learned to speak Cantonese. And so I really wanted to go to university and learn to speak Mandarin. 
And, you know, I thought I was going to have this career in diplomacy and all these sorts of things. And I was good at science, so I thought, look, I'll do the art science degree just in case the Chinese language bit doesn't work out. And then I Okay, so the, the science wasn't even necessarily your first sort of port of call per se. It was actually perhaps some of these other more humanita- humanities, creative, arts-based endeavours. Yeah, it was. That's that's probably a fair way of putting it. I mean, you, because you can do science anywhere. So when I was choosing which university to go to, I wasn't looking at the science options. I was looking at the at the Chinese language humanities options. And mm. the ANU in Canberra actually has a very special, uh, I think it was the Faculty of Asian Studies or maybe it was a, a school within the Faculty of Arts or whatever it was, but they specialise in Asian studies, not just Chinese, but m- almost all Asian languages and cultures. So yeah, so that that was that was what drove that decision, um, mm. and yeah, as I said, I didn't you know I didn't pass everything and study full time the entire time I was at university. It sort of went up and down, um, and it took me seven years. But in the end, I finished uh, I finished my course, both parts of my course, the arts side, the science side, uh, including an honours degree in chemistry. Uh, so I finished on a bit of a high, it's so so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. That's fascinating. So, as I'm sure we'll get into, not many students, or well, not not all university students, have a nice clear cut path of year one, two, three, and perhaps four, start to finish um, sort of completion uh, completion rate. And it sounds like you were perhaps one of those students back in the back in the day. So you yourself had either either struggled or had to take take a bit of time to kind of get to that to get to that endpoint for for whatever reason whatever reasons. Look, absolutely. I mean, there's just there's so many distractions and there's so many other possibilities and things that can can get in the way. And obviously, through my career, having um, been involved in the pastoral care of thousands of of students, science students, I've seen everything. You know, I've seen students who were you know just plain lazy through to students that had some really hardcore stuff going on in their lives. Um, And that could be health, it could be physical health, it could be mental health. It could be that they've just got carer responsibilities. It could be that, um, that, you know, some really heavy stuff has just gone on and they can't focus on anything else. Or they just have to work full time. Oh, yeah. To support themselves financially. That's becoming more and more common as the years go on. Um, You know, it's, it's, you know, give you an example, Lucian, when I was paying rent as a university student, there was one place I was paying $17 a week. Now, I'm, I, yeah, I know wow. I'm a little bit older than you, but I'm not that old. You know, that was that was a bit over 20 years ago, right? $17 Yeah, even a adjusting week. for inflation, that's not equivalent to now. No, correct. You know, that's that was and that was the cheapest place. But even $50 a week, $60 a week, you know, these days you can't get a room in a group house for much less than $250, $300 bucks sometimes. Um, so we see more and more people in, you know, at the university, that typical university age, living with mum and dad, um, or having to live in their own independent, um, you know, location, but having to work 20, 30, some, sometimes even 40 hours a week to get themselves through uni. Now, how on earth could you be a full-time student and work 40 hours a week? I mean, that's crazy. Uh, so think, yeah, 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 that, that, yeah. that's changed a lot. That's that. One of the things that I always found the most impressive about some of my um, peers was whether or not, if they if they did have to work, the fact that they would would work and very often be capable of still carrying. Not all the time. Not not always being able to carry, say, a full time workload, but still maybe a um, a three quarter workload. And they would be able to do that successfully and be able to sort of live a life not too dissimilar, say, from, from my own. I was fortunate enough to be able through just a scholarship and um, family funding to be able to not have to work through my university degree. And I thought, you know, upon reflection and even during that, during my time there, I was had plenty of enough self-awareness to know that that really you know i really uh that was quite um an advantage um that was quite uh, a blessing in a sense to not have that extra pressure to have that extra freedom 
And so when students would work full time, I have a, um, a friend of mine, someone who I know who worked full time throughout her entire degree, stubble, studied a double degree um, and also did trimesters. So he would, wouldn't have these three month long gaps that and month long and month and a half long gaps between uni semesters that we uh, would have in a standard um, two semester degree and be able to sustain that for three or f- four years at a time and do very well and still have a social life. And it's kind of, it would just sort of blow me away. Like I, I, I considered myself a fairly, um, uh, what would you say, academic and well-disciplined, relatively well-disciplined dis- student. But I would think about that and think, my God, uh, I, I could, no, I could not do, I could not have done that. I really do not think that I could have done that. Um, and, and I can tell you from my, you know, experience over 15 years that that, that person is an outlier. You know, they're, yeah, yeah. They're, they're just one of those people who's just completely got it together in, in all ways. And for whatever reason, they can manage that. I can assure you the majority can't, you know, and that's, you know, we've talked about full-time study and full-time work there. That, that, and that, yet there's all those other things. There's sport, there's socialising, there's just having heavy stuff going on in your life. Um, yeah, and everyone has this sort of, you know, this this diversity of experiences. Um, so... Yeah, anyway, we went off on a bit of a tangent there, but hopefully... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, bring us... Yeah, so I did want to just quickly touch on the fact that you did have this sort of perhaps a semi-tumultuous uni degree, one that it actually isn't too... I would probably say almost closer to the norm in some senses probably these days to a standard... the progression of a standard student's university degree than one who just goes from A to B, A being the start, B being graduating with no breaks, no dramas whatsoever. And to just sort of um, proceed the uh, following question, how do you, do you think that benefited you um, ultimately having to take this sort of perhaps more jagged path to the end with perhaps a few more experiences, be they good or bad, um, weaved within them, um, yeah, within uh, throughout that time? Look, so my opinion is very clear on this, that I was definitely better off for having more of a journey over the course of seven years. Um, So, for example, in my case, in my first year at university, I passed everything. I even did one extra subject. I was so enthusiastic about going to university. Mm. But I started socialising a lot and having a lot of fun. So I sort of Mm -hmm. I I did a little bit less in my second year, uh, still managed to pass everything. A couple of those subjects only just passed, as in this close. And then in my third year at university, it just all fell apart. Um, You know, I just completely lost that balance. University subjects, um, as you would know yourself, they start getting harder. You know, second year subjects, third year subjects, they start getting harder. And if you think you can do all that social, in my case, lots of socialising, hanging out at the pub, playing in a rock band, you know, often just being out. Yeah, playing in a rock band is definitely probably not the most conducive thing to a university degree, is it? No, and you know, and 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 that was very distracting as well. I mean, it was it was. You think, oh, where sh- where should I be putting all my energy right now? You know, the the rock band was doing really well. We were playing to big crowds. Um, you know, and then at the end of that year, the rest of the band. So we were in Canberra, right? The the band said well, we want to move to, to Sydney, mm. and I said, well, I haven't finished my degree yet. And, and they were like, well, yeah. you know, we're on a trajectory here. We're going to move to Sydney. And so I, I basically took intermission from uni and just dropped out of uni for 12 months. Yeah, okay, so you to chose Sydney. to follow them. Yeah, that's right. And cut a long story short, stayed with the band for about 12 months, but just wasn't enjoying it. You know, we were, we were just on the dole. We weren't making any money. Um, I was I was stacking shelves at, at Woolies in, in Redfern um, in Sydney, Um you know, supplemented by the doll. The band was travelling around all the time. It was just, it was fun. Not, not a lot of progression, not a lot of stable, positive progression. Correct. And the, it was always niggling away at the back of my mind that I had this unfinished university degree. Yeah. And and I, I, I can tell you that there was guilt associated with that because I know that my family had, my mum in particular, had worked very hard to get me and my sister 
through high school there was you know my parents split up when i was five um mum mm -hmm. remarried years later um but for a long time you know a uh, single parent you know worked her butt off to get her kids through school and all those sorts of things and here was me at 21 22 with an unfinished university degree bumming around sydney playing rock and roll you know and i was someone who i considered myself to be pretty bright and mm -hmm. it was you know i was reflecting at the age of 22 what what the hell am i doing with myself you know i'm having fun uh but you know it was it, it wasn't going anywhere you know um so yeah um you anyway, cut a long story short i left the band at the end of that year and i went back to canberra and over the next three years i i finished off my course but even when i first went back to uni i only went part-time because like i just couldn't take full-time like my, my head just wasn't in the game yeah 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 full full time is look i was so maybe we'll backtrack a second and then we'll get back to there so it's interesting that you said that um or to me at least personally that you started off strong and then around third year things maybe started to to crumble a little bit because i had something and it was probably more commonly within this sort of framework of what you're doing outside of university affecting what you're doing in university it was more i more commonly observed and it was this was a case for myself that it was the other way around where first year would be just this overload and then as one goes to uh, progresses onto third year um you sort of become a bit more in tune with with things and with yourself and the workload and the nature of the work so so i went to halls I stayed at halls for two years at Farrah Hall, one of the most social halls at um, at Monash University, and so I was inundated with social, uh, uh, extracurricular, recreational experience. Um, and I'd also taken a gap year before that, which is something I would definitely recommend to any anyone listening. Um, going straight from school to university, you've perhaps still got that little bit of that edge you've still you're still kind of in the zone mentally perhaps but that gap year gives you that bit of extra time to explore um not just sort of the world around you in that sense and through traveling but also to yourself and to develop a little bit and maybe hone in on what it is that you want to do there but so i had the opposite experience and it was my observation that most of the people around me also had the opposite experience where i didn't do so great in first year, particularly first semester. That was tough. Getting back into university after a year of socializing and not thinking that, um, yeah, not using my cognitive abilities as maybe I, I would have been otherwise. Um, I think I very, I came so close to failing Chem 011, uh, which, is the, which is the first chemistry course. But then that really set the scene for me to pick up my game and to learn and know what to do better for the next semester and then i found that moving on to that second year and that third year you can really you you, you learn you learn you, you can oh, i found that i could learn and some of the students around me were able to learn what it is that you need to do to not <laughs> suffer the same mistakes in university that you might have done in first year and to fall behind to leave yourself stressed um, and to basically make life difficult difficult to yourself and to adjust to the progressive workloads now, of course, I was also lucky enough to sort of do what you did and go part time. And so with throughout half of my second year and the full length of my third year, which I think was so beneficial, um, doing three units in third year with third year subjects was just, uh, um, yeah, you, if you've got the option, like that's really, and you're not too afraid of having a four year rather than a three year degree, then I think that's for sure um, the way to go. Um, but anyway, so now getting back to what I originally wanted to ask you and perhaps a bit more the topic of this, of this podcast, which is sort of the theme of university, what it does, what it's meant for, and the relationship of the student to university and the progression of that of student's personal develop throughout university. What I wanted to ask you was that when, when I was at uni, when I was doing my degree and particularly when obviously when I was in my chemistry classes and I was surrounded by my chemistry peers I so I didn't have you as a lecturer as I mentioned before per se beyond perhaps a few introductory lectures but plenty of my friends and um, other chemistry students did 
and they would have a very common phrase, and that was that Chris is such a good lecturer, such a good educator. He really just makes me – what he tells me just sticks in my head a lot better than – perhaps some of these other um, lectures that I've had, and I'm actually able to sort of enjoy the content that I'm learning, which was really, uh, that's a key point there, is that not, it can actually be quite hard to enjoy the content that you're, that you're learning at university. You can, you can take content that you would have enjoyed outside of university and introduce it to university and actually make it quite unenjoyable for whatever, whatever reason, maybe just because of how much you have to have to dedicate yourself to it. But, so I thought that maybe you could tell me what you thought about those, what you think about those claims and what it is in your mind that creates an effective educator, like an educator or a teacher. I, I like to distinguish those two terms from the word, from, from lecturer, because I think it's, that's, a, uh, that's something worth distinguishing. And so perhaps you could tell us what you think made you uh, such an effective educator, broadly speaking, and what makes an effective educator. And maybe we can then hone in on the fact of uh, teaching chemistry itself as a, as a subject, as a hard science after that. Yeah, look, I mean, I've, I've, look, I've got lots of thoughts on this topic. Um, mm. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> maybe I'll just start with this one. The, the first thing is from, a, from an educator perspective, so as a teacher, you know, and we often walk away from this term teacher at university. You know, oh, teacher, oh, it's so, it's so high school. You know, it's so primary school and high school. You know, at university, we're, we're lecturers or we're professors. And so, I mean, what a load of rubbish. Okay. Lecture teacher. feels very disconnected and uh, dispassionate compared to, or disinterested perhaps is even an even better word, I think, compared to teacher, if I'm not sure if you agree about that. Well, I mean, well, a traditional lecture where there's someone standing at the front of the room talking nonstop for 50 minutes. Students can't ask questions. There's no Q&A. There's no collaboration between, um, between students. Well, that is a very disconnected experience, isn't it? You know, the only thing that the students can connect with are the words coming out of that person's mouth. Um, but in, you know, in education, we often talk about constructing knowledge. So there's knowledge. I mean, there's content and there's knowledge and there's all the stuff in a first-year chemistry book, for example. You know, the, the doing first-year chemistry is not about just, you know, absorbing all of that content into your brain. You know, we, we talk about constructing knowledge. And, you know, real learning happens when individuals construct knowledge for themselves. And they do that through facilitation with their educator and with their with their colleagues, in other words, their peers, their classmates, and, and so mm -hmm. on. So when I was first coming into academia, I was basically, you know, monkeying what I had seen as a student, which was that, you know, person standing at the front of the room and talking for 50 minutes. But very quickly, as you know, I, as I got into my education, I, I created space. So I would shut up and give students the opportunity, A, to ask questions right you know and and you would say nothing until a student asked a question and sometimes those uncomfortable silences they really work or create space for students to talk to each other and over 15 years i actually went not just a little bit down that track um, i went a long way down that track and actually went a little bit too far down that track where i wasn't doing enough teaching and I was saying, oh, no, no, all the content could be delivered in videos and so on. The students watch all the videos before they come. And then when they turn up to class, it's just 100% activities where they're just talking to each other, working through activities. And actually, students don't like that because they do like to be taught some of the time. You know, Did you also perhaps find that, that students wouldn't watch the videos before class if they also had, also had to actually do the lecture? Yeah, it's well? a real mixture. It's a real mixture. And actually, you can make really bad videos as well. Um, mm. And I'm sure probably as a student, you you, you saw some, um, you know, educators. Yeah, those uh, ones that look like they're made in the 90s and right? horrible. <laughs> and it's like, come on, what are you yeah. doing? Get it, make yeah. a new and video. And I mean, that's a whole other thread of this conversation, which hopefully we'll get to, which is, you know, what are the skills that we expect university educators to have? And, and where do they get those skills from? Because actually the people we recruit, we recruit them because, because they're kick-ass researchers. That's how they get the jobs. Every single one of my colleagues in the School of Chemistry got their job because they're good at researching topic X. 
It's not because they were they're good, good at teachers. being not, yeah chemist chemists in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. None of them. None of them were appointed because they were a good teacher. You know, they're expected by some sort of mysterious process of osmosis, uh, or just copying what they'd seen by you know the people that taught them to be good teachers. You know, that, that's crazy. You know, we wouldn't put people in a high school, but on that assumption. Mm-hmm. You know, they go through a rigorous you know, bachelor degree or they do a bachelor degree and then they do a master of teaching or whatever. You know, they won't get VIT registration, so high school registration, without being taught how to be a teacher. Whereas in universities, that's that's not the case at all. Um, anyway, we, we, uh, we sort of went off track. Yeah, maybe we'll maybe we'll, that's a... That's a- that's a good topic, and I, maybe we'll get to that in a second. So yeah. we we'll, we'll, and perhaps perhaps after this. So we were on on the theme of what made and what makes an effective educator, and what made you, in your in your opinion, an effective educator. And so, in 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 your eyes, it was at least in part because of the way that you would engage with the students, the delivery. So like the delivery of content, you mentioned the words, the term constructing knowledge. And uh, I think you, so you suggested that constructing knowledge was something better done when there was students who were able to engage with the content or the knowledge in perhaps a different format than just the lecture board, the speaker sort of, sort of delivery um, through either yeah. video talking or, or, or activities. So let me give you a really simple example of that. So and I know not all of your listeners are going to actually care about chemistry education, so we won't go into any deep chemistry at all. But there's a topic, it's called dipoles, so it's polarity of mm-hmm. molecules, and it's mm-hmm. a classic first the difference topic. in electrical charge across, exactly. across, exactly. uh, across so the structure of the molecule. You got it. So it doesn't matter which university in the world you go to, if you're studying chemistry, you will learn this topic in first year. Um, so the way we would we 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 would teach it. So I say we because I, I co-taught this stuff with a guy by the name of Toby Bell, who's a spectroscopist also at Monash University, great educator. Um, so we would teach the concepts. We would give a few examples. But then we did the very simple thing of uh, handing out an A4 sheet of paper double-sided with about 20 molecules on one side and 20 molecules on the other side. And, and we just gave 10 minutes for students to talk to each other and discuss every single molecule and see, see if they could work out for themselves where the dipole moment was. And then we would go through it as a group up the front of the room. And I remember when we first did it, we were still using overhead projectors. My God, it's uh, crazy to think about. And then document yeah. cameras. Uh, we, yeah, you know, we, we moved beyond that little sort light of and you slide the document on the thing and that projects that back yeah. there. Yeah, it's yeah. all it's all you know Ancient. more technology in the classroom these days. But is, but yeah. but th- th- this was an awesome moment, right? Because students had had five or ten minutes to sort of have a go themselves, and it almost became like a competition. You know, it was like as Toby or I would go through on oh, this is the answer to this one, this is the answer. You know, people starting to cheer in the back of the room and all that sort of stuff. The, you know, it was engaging. And 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 when people got something wrong, they they can see why they got it wrong. We because we talked about it, and or or they you know they talked to the person next to them, say, well, well, I thought it was this, you know, and um, but that is such a simple thing to do, you know, an A4 sheet of paper, and you just give them ten minutes. Like that's 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 not rocket science, but that was such an effective activity. Um, yeah, because so- what well, I suppose what what it is that you're doing there with that activity is you're really you're giving the students to, the space to actually think and participate and engage for themselves in that moment, rather than simply having to be hard drives that are trying to download just whatever it is is flicking through the screen and on the on the, on the projector and whatever it is that you're saying that sort of accompanying that and it's seem there's almost an not really an element i'm not sure if i'd go as far as to as far as to say there's an element of play there but there's a sort of element of personal engagement and development development of there being a clear goal you being able to try to reach that goal and there being maybe some little little reward at the end of saying if you succeed in that thing well then it's like oh okay maybe um Maybe I'm not as not so bad at this as as I thought. So there's a little bit of also reward element 
attached attached in there however however slight it might be and then also that group participation um as well and so this this sort of ties into something that i wanted to get to which was so chemistry so chemistry and i would hazard just things like physics and perhaps other physical and what you would might call the hard the hard sciences in terms of not because they're so much harder than the other sciences but because of their um the fundamental fundamental nature um physical material nature there's it can it can be very it can be pretty it can be sterile in a sense so it's been my experience that um and my observation that when one wants to communicate something and to and 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 to teach something the more narrative that you can make that the the that that bit of thing that you want to communicate the more that you can put it into some kind of narrative form where there's almost like a little bit of a story woven into it that has perhaps some kind of that can have some kind of personal relevance um that you can identify with maybe in some sense or maybe that you can kind of explore a little bit more um broadly just internally when you have something that's presented in that sort of narrative form it can be a lot more stimulating than something that is more s- sterile and very perhaps almost mechanistic and just sort of one two three this is that this does this does that does that does that and and so now go and apply that and then that'll do that and it was i'm not so sure that you can really with these hard sciences and something like chemistry make it turn it into a narrative make things narrative like you can maybe even in things like psychology sociology the humanities where you can weave these stories based in some kind of some kind of um social reality um psychological reality that is much more easily engaged with and can be more more stimulating and um things things along those lines and i'm not so sure that you can to, you might be able to be able to do that to an extent with chemistry but it's perhaps you can, it's just to an extent um and so there's the challenge there of that kind of receptivity and then what what sort of what do you do about that and what are the consequences um of that so so what what, what do you make of that yeah so maths physics and chemistry the, you know the one thing that ties them together you know whether you call them the physical sciences or the hard sciences or whatever and they're very abstract at times not always but m- much of the time they're very abstract um they're very impersonal so, as well yeah so so how do you, how do you tie the topics that you're talking about how do you tie that back to people's personal lives now i'll give you a really good example of that it's not by it's not chemistry it's biochemistry so i had um so i do education research and many of my phd students um are not doing chemistry research they're doing science education or chemistry education research and in one case Kathy Fernandez, Dr. Kathy Fernandez, because she's finished her PhD. Her PhD was about biochemistry. Now she was from the Philippines where she taught biochemistry herself. But just like in Australia, in the Philippines, it's a topic that is taught to psychology students, nursing students, medical science students, pharmacy students. So all in the health field, but very diverse career paths there. They're coming into those courses with very different um scores so to get into pharmacy you need a pretty high score to get into nursing in australia a much much lower score so that's an extremely diverse cohort now why would you teach biochemistry to to all of those students in exactly the same way you know when you say it out loud like that doesn't that doesn't make sense but historically that is exactly what we did we taught biochemistry and all of its abstract concepts to to doesn't matter what the student's background was or what they were what career progression they were chasing we just taught them nuts and bolts biochemistry Kathy's PhD was all about context based learning so for example if you're um if you're teaching um say the proteins topic to nursing students well why would why would they care about proteins choose a context that you know is based on a real clinical setting for a nurse where they have to make cutting edge decisions about patient care where they have to draw on their biochemistry knowledge. 
because that's going to be completely different for a psychology student, completely different for medical science student, completely different for pharmacy. So she developed four different contexts for when you were teaching topic topic X, Y, and Z, and she did the research around that. And um, without going into her whole, whole project, I mean, one of the most striking findings was that student anxiety um, came right down by Im embracing context-based learning in more meaningful ways for those students. Um, many other findings as part of that PhD, but for me, that's a, really, that's a really big one. Students just less anxiety, felt more comfortable to the topic and saw how it was relevant to their potential career. So, yeah, so the challenge is to, to take these abstract topics and that narrative that you were talking about before, had, how can you how can you how can you capture that? Um, and when you've got a really diverse cohort, it can be tricky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what you were just talking about before, this context based learning. So there's sort of with this this, this dynamism perhaps between say narrative versus a more sterile, um, straightforward teaching mechanism, when you're because so the student is the res, the receiving agent. Um, on this end and so you're sort of you're working with them in their totality and so you can sort of it this it seems like there's sort of two two things two routes that you have to either re, you can rely on or that you have to to follow there in terms of reaching of reaching that student when you're trying to teach them something and you're trying to make them engage with something you so you can either have a student that has already something like a vested personal interest in the topic at a semi-fundamental level for whatever reason say you're you've grown this was an, ex an example of my uh, my cousin who went to monash university and studied um me mechatronics so growing up he was always interested in things like software um electricals and uh robotics things very much interested in in things and has and had this sort of passion from a young age and explored that um, growing up, and so by the time that he reached university, <clears throat> university, he very much knew what it was that he had an interest in, sort of still broadly speaking, but also um, sort of within nicely fitted within a genre, so to speak, of things. So he already sort of knew what it is that he what it was that he would like would like to pursue. Um, and that really, so when that obviously led him to engineering and then that, that led him to down a certain path in engineering, but he never really had much trouble as far as I, as far as I know with engaging with firstly different courses, but within those courses, the different topics within those courses, because, you know, you can take a course that's, th that you think sounds interesting, but there's very often there's bits within that course that you don't you don't care about it all. And it's sort of like, well, this is just, and that's maybe where you don't do as well um, as, 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 as you might have otherwise. So that allowed him to, 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 do, to do quite well and to stay consistent and to not have any particular anxiety or questions of self-doubt or, or purpose or meaning while he was, while he was there. Now that might've come, come later down the line um, as, as we all, not that it necessarily did, but that he just didn't really have that in the moment there. Now, so you've sort of got that as an example. That's quite a classic, one classic example of a student, I think. And another classic, ex and you could sort of summarize that as some, as as someone who has a part of their character, their values um, already sort of nice to, to an extent, nicely defined and self-determined. Um, in a way that they are aware of so they can are easily able to use their values to inform their um their actions to choose how to how to act and then use those actions to sort of reinforce and validate those values and also their identity and to sort of in, incur what's at least a neutral or a more likely a positive sort of cycle but on the other end and this was sort of this was definitely where I was for at least a time and where I think a lot more people are is, is that is that they don't really have sort of any clear, you could say value necessarily value structure going in to university. They don't have necessarily um, preconceived 
consolidated interests in certain topics and certain genres that has some kind of um, per, a personal um, investment that they have some kind of personal investment in and can sort of extrapolate that out to some kind of future self. Um, and so they get to university and they feel lost and they don't really know what it is that they're doing there. And they take this subject and that's then that subject and they don't have, they don't have the motivation. Um, they don't necessarily have that, that motivation to actually learn and to want to know the content. Perhaps what I forgot to mention before was is if, if you're already personally invested in learning something, it's not because you're being told to learn it or that you have to learn it as maybe part of this broader abstract thing, which isn't even well, hasn't been well conceptualized personally and hasn't been well conceptualized to you by, by other people. It's, it's much easier if you, if you do have this sort of value structure in place to be receptive to, um, to learning and to, and to this, and to this knowledge and to want to take it on board and to actually seek it out. Whereas on the other hand, if you don't, then it's sort of like, well, I'm just having to learn this. It's more just like I'm feeling a hard drive. I don't get this positive necessarily reward from learning this thing because learning that thing doesn't necessarily relate to anything good in the future that I can identify with. Um, and so, and then that sort of progresses on throughout the university degree until maybe you even drop out or you suffer from anxiety and depression and you don't do very well, or maybe you do do well, but you come out of it like, fuck, why, what have I just done? Why have I done that? Like shit, I'm, uh, you know, not left, basically not left in a good place. Um, and now tying that back, I think where I was, um, Gone. I went on a bit of a tangent there. So well, that I'm, was I'm a good tangent, though. Remember. Can I just I'm, make a couple of comments yeah, yeah. about that? I mean, the, so, you know, if you're talking about first-year chemistry, for example, and it's a good example because it's, it's many science students will do chemistry. The cohort at Monash is over a 1,000 students. You know, the diversity in that group is enormous. So as the educator, if, if, if I'm buying into everything you were just saying, which I do, um, how... how how do you tie that curriculum into the values of those students so that they will invest in the topic? The, the values are so important. Well, across a thousand students, there's actually going to be a real breadth of, of, of value there, but some really nice ideas that some people have been playing with, for example, um, are you familiar with the 17 uh, su uh, sustainable development goals? It's a, it's, um, it's a, it's a UN Thing. Yeah, yeah. I I have actually been doing for my work. I've I've just come across a few of a few of those. Right. But yes, I'm broadly I'm broadly familiar. Um, no, I mean, it's a fantastic yeah. framework. It includes everything. You know, you know, zero poverty. Um, you know, clean, Life on clean land, environment, kind of clean thing. water, um, good uh, looking after the environment, land, um, and all those sorts of things. There's some people who have mapped the first year chemistry curriculum to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I and over the course of 12 months... You, I think you can... I possibly, maybe even my own chemistry degree, I think maybe within the report, maybe, sorry, maybe this isn't exactly what you're talking about, but often within when you write a report for a practical that you did, I think you had to try and relate back to some sort of little framework. Maybe it wasn't the same thing as that, but something similar. Yeah, but it's... it's and I'm not sure... Yeah, in that example, but it, it, that's about trying to make those connections, helping students try to make those connections to their values. You know, learning all this chemistry, why should I give a shit? Why is it Why is it relevant to my life? You know, trying to help students make those connections. It's tricky because of that diversity of the student body. Um, and it's not a particularly the days personal where teach... subject either. So it's hard to touch on those. It's hard to touch on matters of identity, um, um, and that's those are really for whatever reason, um, and it's and even the and the learning development in chemistry is quite narrow. It's very much just sort of chemistry. Now that sits within the broader, slightly broader framework of a scientific education, and you could start and you could go into the philosophy of science there, but it's still very much narrow and not. It's hard to kind of extrapolate out and maybe generate some broader some broader meaning uh, from that, so going off what you're saying there, yeah. Yeah, oh, look, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough. And you know, we always have a small proportion of students and for whatever reason, they're in love with chemistry. They've already decided they want to be a chemist and, and all those sorts mm, of things. They've already decided. 
Good point. They're not the students we worry about. Like they're fine. That let's let them cruise, and usually they do well because they've got this this, this purpose. It's the other ninety percent of students, and at least the number is probably that high. Um, they know they like chemistry. They're kind of good at it. But where is it going? You know, and I have known so many students over the years. They're in the final year of their course. They have no idea where it's going. I didn't know where it was going when I, when I was at the same point in my career, right? And I think it's normal. But, yeah, so it's tricky. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, okay, so I think we can agree that there's, yeah, chemistry, there can be challenges there. Um, in learning and we can I think we can extrapolate some of these principles that we've been talking about about being a uni student um, and this idea of of, of values just more broadly um, broadly broadly across the spectrum so perhaps I'm just wondering where we go to next and after we follow that okay maybe let's let's I think we'll sort of touch back on some of this stuff again in a second but just wanted to, because that'll make up a larger part of this conversation later, I think. But are there? So, what were? So, you were an education um, education researcher, and I have a quote here from. Um, I think I found from an article, uh, a paper that you wrote, that was with something along the lines of investigating whether there is a mismatch between the knowledge and skills developed through undergraduate study. And those actually required in post um, graduation activities. So maybe we could just quickly divert to the topic of education research and um, what what you what 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 it is that you that you learned from that. Yeah. So the, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I know which paper you're talking about, and it's the my most highly cited paper by other people, mm-hmm. um, and it's and it's a piece of work I'm really proud of. So. Um, uh, work that I did closely with Professor Tina Overton, but also led by a guy by the name of Mahbub Sakar, um, which we we called it the Gems Project, and it was it was just an acronym which just stood for Graduate Employability for Monash Science Students, um, and there had been a lot of work that had already been done speaking to employers about science graduates, what did they think science graduates were good at and, and not so good at and so on. There was much less work, and this is going, this was six years ago, we put this paper out. There had been much less work where people actually went and spoke to students, sorry, I should say graduates, to ask them, well, what are the skills that you got at university that you are using in the workplace? What are the skills that you never developed at university but were critical in the workplace and everything in between? So we ended up with a really um, clear and probably not surprising map of what those skills were. Uh, but, you know, some of the areas of, you know, severe underdevelopment were quite striking. Um, so, you know, most most science students, for example, actually don't necessarily go on and work very directly in science. You know, they go and work for consulting companies. They work for, the go- for government, for public service, for not-for-profit organisations. They become entrepreneurs. Um now, in just about every all of those contexts, and for that matter, actually being a scientist at the coalface, you know, the cost of what you're doing, as in the financial cost of what you're doing, it's pretty damn important. Well, where in a science degree do we ever teach students about commercial awareness, budgets, um, the cost of doing science or the cost of running a business? Nowhere, pretty much nowhere, you know. And so we had students who were emerging from from a course going out into the workplace and they were saying my employer expected me to know how to prepare a budget or actually do a costing for the work that they expected me to do. I've never been asked to do that before. Um, Now employers, they don't necessarily think that's that's their job to teach employees. uh, They they may have to pick up from a certain point relative to the business. But this this sort of topic of what we went on to call commercial awareness, it was striking. So graduates were saying, we just felt like we were completely thrown in the deep end because at uni, this was never talked about in class. So for example, you would have done a whole bunch of chemistry experiments as as a part of your your course. How often were you asked to to manage the budget of doing that experiment? Mm. Were you you ever asked, and you know, how much does this molecule cost? Not very often. I think I think perhaps second and third year, some reports would 
near the end kind of ask a sort of superf almost superfluous sort of question or set of questions regarding yeah some sort of more real life um related uh yeah some real life related questions whether more to do with say the workplace or that in the context of a workplace related to that topic or or maybe you know, you've got to do an executive summary as if you're talking, writing for a, for a business. Yeah, so we, we put that stuff in. So five years earlier, that stuff wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that came out of this work. Um, so an executive summary, for example, like if you go into any, any like government, corporate, whatever, um, you've got to communicate your science, but you've got to do it briefly and you've got to do it to you know, communicate it to a bunch of people who don't know anything about the science. You know, they, they, they digest that in the form of an executive summary or something like that. Yeah, the executive so, summary section was good. I've had to, because you, you learn to write a report pretty well by the end of your chemistry degree. You learn, you learn how to be scientific. You learn to think in terms of introducing, introducing a topic, the, a methodology that's needed to arrive or explore a certain hypothesis or arrive at a certain end, how you display your results the nature of your dis of a discussion and a conclusion but the executive summary where you've sort of condensing all of that for my what i do now for for the business that i work for which is where i work in the carbon startup for the carbon industry i do a lot of our sort of writing um document writing and so something like a um an executive summary uh is you, you see it elsewhere and it's also quite useful if you've got these 20 plus page long documents filled with technicalities and findings yeah. and whatnot here and there. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, so that, that's just an example of, of one of the things that came out of that education research. But I mean, I, the, the, that's one of the reasons I really like that project because that research actually changed the curriculum. It changed what we did with, um, with assessment. Um, it, it wasn't research that was just done for the sake of research and actually never eventuated anything. It eventuated in change. And that work has been picked up at other universities across the science sector. So it's a really, really popular piece of work. That research paper has been cited by government organisations and all sorts of things. So really proud of that. Okay. And, and so, yeah, so what, maybe just, just quickly, what, what impact do you think that may have actually had? Because speaking from the experience of, a uni student who has got a lot of other things on that they have to do already has to write that lab report and write it well, has to think quite, if you want to do well on it, you have to think quite thoroughly about that lab report. And then you get to the end of that and you have to sort of write something about how this relates to some, hypo um, some hypothetical and you don't really want to spend any more time thinking about that anymore. Or, or engaging with this, or this sort of abstraction at the end. How, how do you think that sort of um, plays in? How do you think that's that's actually t that's turned out having those additions? Yeah, I think that's a really fair question, and I, I I think a part of the answer to that question is if we add all this stuff on top, but we don't take away some of the other workload that you would have done previously. Well, all we're doing is giving you more work. And, I, and you made the comment yourself, well, by the end of the course, you got pretty good at writing a lab report. Over three years, or if, however long it takes you to do your chemistry major, you might write 70 lab reports. Why do you have to write 70 lab reports? Surely 40 lab reports is still a lot of lab reports. And so I think if we don't, if we don't keep a close eye on workload, people, uh, students just get cynical about the stuff that we're throwing at them. So... Um, I and think that's perhaps, part of the answer. If I could add a, if I could add a good a, a little point there, so I like what you said in terms of reducing the volume um, of those, perhaps reducing the volume, but also really increasing the quality of the feedback within those reports. And I'm not, and not just about the specific theory or the the topic of that lab report, but um, and of that experiment, but more how a student is writing, how to write. Um, th things along those lines because it's it, I'm someone so I'm, I'm I'm quite good at writing it's something that I've always been quite good at and that's because it, at least in part because I've been reading a lot my whole life um, so that, it's always just something I've enjoyed and I think I can say that fairly at this point and a lot most people aren't very good at writing 
to be like to be completely to be completely fair even people that have a degree and have gone on and whatnot maybe they can and even if you're just getting down to the point of because you know you've got to learn to write the sentence but you got to learn to what words to use in that sentence you've got to learn how to structure the words you've got to learn how that sentence relates to the all the other sentences in the paragraph then how that paragraph relates to the broader the broader text whatever that is and that's not a skill that is it's maybe sort of it's taught to an extent at school and is perhaps then let go uh is is let almost certainly actually let go particularly in the sciences i think at university and then you kind of get comments made um made made here and there but anyway that's that's um that's that's we can get to that later when we talk about maybe the, the functionality of university itself because i'm sure that's um, got some things to say about that, but did you want to add anything more about this topic of um, um, expanding the sort of anal- the, this this idea of gra- graduate employability and what you don't learn at university? Because then I can add some things onto that. Well, I mean, the, the, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, I did leave Monash um, not just just over a month ago, and. I'm currently unemployed for what it's worth. I mean, it won't last forever, so I'm just enjoying it. If anyone, it yeah, if anyone, if you've got any headhunters watching, not yeah, look at the, 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 but... the, the last thing that I was doing over the summer, the most recent summer, was supervising 100 students that were doing work placements. So this is actually a six credit point unit that you do as a part of your course, so it counts towards your degree, but you're effectively just out in the workplace. And the only academic assessment that is pinned to that is is really reflections. So student write, um, they write a, a midpoint reflection and a final reflection, which I had the pleasure of reading and, and assessing. And, you know, there were so many students who, who, who were reflecting that, that they were learning things during these placements that, that was just, it blew their mind, you know. So they had done, you know, that you do 20 units to complete your course and just one of them was this work placement. The other 19 units, it's just lots and lots of content, lots and lots of science or electives from other faculties or whatever. And they were having mind-blowing experiences because they were in a real workplace, seeing the dynamics of a real workplace. They were learning things were being... pertinent to them for that they yeah. can actually act on relevant to their actual experience as well. Absolutely. would be happening. Absolutely, and they were seeing how real workplaces operated, and and what what an employer is actually expecting of them, um, and perhaps sometimes they, they they were expecting to have their hand held, and they weren't. They were just thrown in the deep end, or maybe it was the other way around. And because um, of course, every, not every workplace works the same way, um, but the, I, I'm not sure one out of twenty units is enough of authentic real world experiences that should be in a course. And there are courses elsewhere at other universities. They're doing much more than one out of 20 guys. That's 5%. Um, so yeah. Yeah. not sure yeah. if we got the balance yeah. right there. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically what we've kind of been going over for then for the past um, little while, maybe 10, 15 minutes or so is what it is that universities and courses within universities are failing to do for students. Well, they just, they fail, um, to teach. And so there's the argument, and it's one that I'm quite fond of, is that in principle, fundamentally, a university is there to do three things. It's to teach you, it's to teach you to, to think, it's to teach you to write, and to teach you to speak. Now, and to base and to develop those very fundamental personal capacities, and to, and to, and to further that, that sort of intrinsic level of development that is um yeah we just leave it it's a fundamental it's what you could say just about everything else um rests upon now in now this is probably something that's done to varying degrees depending on what type of course it is that you're studying perhaps in a humanities degree at least theoretically you've got more um more room to have perhaps think more broadly about what it is that you're being taught with because when you start entering sort of the less objective fundamental um, perspectives there's more rooms for interpretation of different phenomena and you can sort of explore that a little bit more 
um, explore things a little bit more personally. And then you can also write about that a little bit more because you probably also have to write in a more slightly still conf- constrained, but also more creative sense than you would something like a, a lab report or even um, um, a, a, a other written report in, in chemistry for some kind of, for some kind of other assignment assignment. And then maybe you'd also have opportunities to speak through debates or, or this and this and that. And so I think chemistry is, and perhaps again, the hard sciences, maybe and something like math in particular probably isn't going to teach you to speak particularly well. It's probably not, maybe not also going to teach you to, to write very well. Um, just because of, what the what the nature of the output is but maybe that's something that and when i think when i say speak sorry when i say in think in particular not just to teach you what um what to think which is very much what you do in say a course like chemistry not just in that sense but through you, you know this this does that and then that happens and then um and then so forth with this whole array of sort of of content but not just what to think but but how to think how to even begin to think about to approach thinking about things and you get this sometimes for sure where someone will perhaps explain the sort of precepts of science and the scientific um empirical empirical sort of impartial um inquiry and how to um sort of employ that more more broadly but it's not something that was particularly well articulated in my course that in my own estimation and it's not something that i think witnessed as well articulated in some of my fellow in my fellow peers so now going so you took the stance you've taken the stance of in what university fails to teach in terms of graduate um employability and so maybe the side of the student that has to engage commercially with some kind of commercial entity or phenomenon um and and then those the sort of the 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 levels of character and development that that comes that comes with that and you also talked about how um courses are perhaps overly stuffed with things that they don't need to be overly stuffed with that could then be replaced by other things perhaps pertaining more to the nature of self-awareness and personal development on a broader on a broader scale and so where this is going is when i was in my third year of university i had a a lecturer the name of jason chu he was um he was a he was a first year finance lecturer and in my very first um lecture class the first week for i think perhaps Unfortunately, it was only like the last 10 minutes of the class or so, or 15 minutes, because as we just said, lectures are so stuffed full and courses so so stuffed full with all this content that seemingly you can't get rid of because then we'll, you leave this gap in, but this is so important. And what, what, my God, if you don't learn that, then fuck, you know, you're, you're screwed kind of thing, which really probably isn't nearly the, much, the case as much as some people might um, might be inclined to think. Um, he had, he had his, so he's the, he's the chief, uh, chief examiner and the, um, the unit coordinator. So he constructed this slide and on this slide, there were two sections. And as the title was something along the lines of why are you at university? And within his two sections, he had two headings. One was intellectual maturity and emotional maturity. And so he wove this little narrative or, and got his, got his in as much in as his lecturers were able to do so to weave this little narrative to students about why they're at university beyond the strict sort of sterile regime of what they're specifically being learnt, taught in this lecture course for some theoretical specific purpose at the end that sort of is all detached and employment and future and all these other things that maybe kid uh, students and kids can't connect with yet and identify it with very well and so he talked about things like um, critical thinking, responsibility, um, self-awareness, um, attention to certain kinds of detail, um, all these sort of um, sort of fundamental aspects of 
character that really that speak to a person's identity, individuality, and their self develop and their self development. And I found that incredibly fascinating because that was the first time I'd ever. So I did a double major of chemistry and economics. Um, so I had both business faculty and chemistry faculty. That was the first time I ever encountered anything like that at university, and I and I was, and I sat there, kind of like uh, almost in shock, as because these were kind of things that I'd been thinking about personally as I was undergoing my own little journey of trying to figure out, orient my values, personal values, and what I thought it was I wanted to do with my time, and then what it is I could also get from university and learn from university, and so I th- I found that very um, compelling. And I think a lot more compelling, actually, than a lot of my the, the students around me who are mostly first years. So they hadn't even really probably reached the point yet where they could be receptive to such things. It was too busy the, by the fact of simply university and like it was this haze over their eyes and being young and figuring their own shit out and um, not yet being able to or having the capacity to pay attention to um, to the right things. And something that he mentioned and they got his lecturers to mention was just how much that little, an impact that little slide made to in from graduate to, to graduates that paid attention, how much of an impact that made to their sense of self, their personal development and how they framed university and perceived university in their time at university, but then also how that affected their performance outside of, outside of university, um, outside of university too. And then that led me to, um, stimulated me to write this, uh, talk, which I delivered, um, in the second semester of 2019 called finding value at university and trying to present this view of university that was more abstracted and more value personal, personally based or, or that was moving towards developing something like a personal philosophy about your time at university and your own identity and what it is you want from life and how you can perceive what it is even that you're doing if you don't even if you don't enjoy sort of doing it so abstracting as well in a sense like maybe okay maybe I'm doing this chemist this chemistry or economics course right now and it's not particularly I'm not particularly stimulated by it, but I know that this is still stimulating my ability to think and to comprehend and maybe to abstract and be scientific. And so that's sort of a little, and that's important to me for various values or goals that I have. And so I can take a little bit of satisfaction in that um, more broadly speaking. Um, and And I can find these little points of personal development throughout university insofar as they possibly do exist but and you we actually had that was, we had a very brief email exchange i don't think you remember i i brought some comments uh, there's some comments here that i'm not sure if i'm bothered going over them that you made that were sort of a little bit more maybe um were sort of almost like pushing back a little bit in terms of saying well you know maybe students at uni just to secure a job um Maybe that's just like you, I'm, I'm not sure if this, if I'm misremembering this, um, were the first in their family to attend university. So they're just trying to get through what this sort of, this milestone that has all these social implications um, are with them too. And maybe others are philosoph- following this philosophy without that needing to be pointed out. And that was actually a little bit in response to me suggesting that this kind of teaching, these kinds of thoughts, should be better integrated into courses, no matter what the course is, like almost something like an, a lecture at the start of each course, no matter what it is, unit, going over the matters of self, personal development, um, in a way that aren't ide- ideologically tainted at all as much as possible. And um, instead focus on this, uh, on yeah, on the student's self, sense of self and identity and personal development. A little bit more. So, what do you, so what do you, what do you make of all that? What's your response to it? Well, the first thing is, I, I mean, I think you've you've had a you've had a really lucky experience, uh, Jason. Was it Jason Chu? Is that is the name you said? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's 
that, that's some pretty deep insight that 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 he's got and has made that decision himself to integrate that into his curriculum. So one of my first reflections is, um, and this is not a criticism of my colleagues, but they themselves exist across a very broad spectrum of personalities mm-hmm. and characteristics. Mm-hmm. So it's a very important purpose. point that you 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 are, you are having to rely also on an individual's own sense of awareness and perception and also their thoughtfulness about these kinds of things these things too yeah. so yeah so let's break that down for a second and we'll just focus on chemistry as a nice case study so who are the 30 or so academics all the way from junior lecturer up to professor like Doug McF- uh, Doug McFarlane who you've also had on the podcast um, who are these people what is their background what's their life journey been now i'm certainly not going to categorize them as people who the only thing in their life is chemistry because that wouldn't be fair but it's not it's not that far off that so all of these people they have hobbies they have families they have um their own idiosyncrasies and the stuff that they do outside university which build up their identity and their character but they are people who went through university they were good at university they were good at chemistry they went on they've double done phds um their whole existence their whole existence professionally is is hinges on actually not even their ability to teach their ability to do research how are they measured they're measured by the pub papers that they publish in journals they're measured by the grant income that they get from the australian research council and whoever else their own bubble it's it's pretty contained, you know, and I've got some colleagues who I still describe as pretty well-rounded individuals. But when they're in that role as a university educator, I don't think there's many who see their role in the same way that Jason Chu sees his role, which mm-hmm. I think you've had a really special experience there. Oh, he's a, he's a, put, I'm, I'm so grateful that I've got to make his acquaintance. He's a very very thoughtful and insightful person and actually and and really and like you as well he really he cares he pays attention he pay that's the thing he pays attention and he cares and he and he has this um and he's able to employ employ sort of personality into the whole thing as well and he's also a really mm-hmm. good lecturer as we we're talking before in terms of being able to be in terms of flow and narrative and and whatnot even with something even with something like finance yep and so I think we've, you know, historically we're coming from a time where a lecturer's job was to lecture, and they lectured about chemistry, and they did that for fifty minutes three times a week, or sixty minutes or whatever it is. That was their job, you know. And this this whole in curriculum versus extracurricular, uh, you know, there were the very clear battle lines for a very very long time. You know, where do students learn to write a CV? Where do they develop their employability skills or preparing for employment? But that was extracurricular. For decades, that was perceived as something that, you know, in class, in chemistry, for example, they learn about chemistry and that's it. That's the only thing they learned about. And all those other skills that they need to be a successful professional, they learn about that outside of class. They do it through, you know, these days, and I would have colleagues who still think this, they would go over to the career centre in the uh, in the campus center you've, you're probably f- familiar with it at monash and you might do a workshop with the careers counselors or uh, all, all those sorts of things and that these are two different universes and they shouldn't overlap you know and that's what i've been breaking working really hard to try and break is that yeah. that all these things don't belong in curriculum of course they belong in curriculum you know like the, the students put value on the things that we put value on and we know what's important for students. They don't just need to know lots of chemistry. They need to know all the other stuff. So we, if we believe that's valuable, then we should be putting value on it by putting it and integrating it across the curriculum. So what do you think specifically is missing there then? And what do you think that, yeah, that students are missing specifically there in regards to the lecturer or the educator and what it is that just what 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 it is that they shouldn't be missing out on or how or or what should be there that isn't so that's where for me that's where i still don't have a good answer to your question and yeah at, I, at the risk of it same it's not a easy it's not a 
it's simply not an easy question because it it sort of goes right to the heart of what is the purpose of a university and what is or perhaps more specifically what is the purpose of that course that it, that you're trying to take and what should that course look like and as we've just discussed previously at least one thing you can probably we might be able to say about some of these courses is that they don't need to be as dense as they are and they can perhaps have a little bit more maybe life to them um in in some senses and would you so do you think that this the proposition that of doing something like what jason did or somehow weaving this these concepts and this is this has to be obvious it's difficult because this has to be done by the right person or has to be constructed by the right person and then delivered by the right people who also kind of think and feel the same way and and have the enough sort of awareness of their own and 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 connection to these ideas of their own personally to be able to communicate them and believe them that this idea of self development personal development at these all these kinds of levels emotional maturity um um, intellectual maturity, being able to think right and speak, being able to be self-aware, trying to teach something along the lines of of wisdom, of general of of wisdom to students, rather than just regurgitate knowledge that you can regurgitate and maybe allows you to perform a rote task or function um, um, at an institution uh, later on. That that somehow should, at least in theory, be integrated into into the into the heart of these of a, of a course of a, of a of a subject so i think so short answer yes now for me you know what's the limiting factor i mean if we you know if we think this all makes sense why don't why aren't we already doing this and the the thing that i always come back to is you know you're dealing with people you're dealing with humans so, okay, so who are the humans? And I go back to, well, who are those 30 humans, for example, that we have hired to run the School of Chemistry? And they were hired for very particular reasons, so I won't repeat myself on that front. Yeah. But let can we just break that down to a, a, a really particular individual? Because the School of Chemistry has just been given the green light. They're going to hire a new organic chemist. So they write the, they write the position description for this, you know, kick-ass organic chemists so it goes out internationally they're looking for the best person internationally so what what are the what what are you looking for in that person because if that person is actually going to spend 50 percent of their time doing research but the other 50 percent of their time they're going to be teaching they're going to be interacting with 18 19 20 21 year olds and mature age students to deliver the sorts of experiences that we've just been talking about is that how do you write that into the position description? Because what we're really good at is saying, oh, how many papers have they published? You know, what was the pedigree of their PhD? You know, how do you assess they... character? You know, that's what you're how do you assess the character? Sense of character. And actually, I've seen so many times where we've gotten it wrong, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. And we thought we might have even been reading between the lines and picking up on aspects of character. A few years later, you hired the person and you're reflecting and you think, gee. We sure got we sure got that appointment wrong, you know. We thought we saw this in the job interview, and actually, we're, we're realizing a few years later we're not getting any of that at all. It's really hard. It's really hard, mm-hmm. and so I think we fall back on those very mechanical metrics, KPIs, papers, money, because we can measure that really easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that hum- itself humanity can result through with students you don't you don't need a good lecturer to get make to make sure a student enrolls and pays money for the university but if you want a a particular individual to generate money for the university then you want someone who's going to have those specific competencies to do that mm. right so yeah look absolutely so the so the question then becomes so if you know we we try and keep focused on your big question which is you know the purpose of a university so well what is a university it is it is it bricks and mortar is it the people is it is it the knowledge is it the experience you're trying to create well it's probably a little bit of all of those sorts of things but none of it works without the people so i would argue it's it actually starts with the people that you put in the university and i'm talking about the staff here so you're curating an experience for students or who is the people you hire so i I would genuinely be casting the spotlight 
on how we hire yeah. the people. So change, do you think, ch so change it, let's say that what we're, what we're discussing here is that there's maybe something suboptimal about universities. We're talking about a way in which they could be a direction in, in which they could be steered toward optimally to perhaps be a little bit, a little bit better. And you're positing that a, a change in educators and those individuals directly within the university, not necessarily a fundamental changing of the structuring of the courses and so what have you, at least not initially within the university that it's no, it's the, it's, it's the people and, and perhaps because obviously you've, what we've just been saying is that you've got these incentives, incentive, incentives for faculty that are ultimately perverse when it comes to students and the obviously universities are research institutions but they're also very much education institutions and so that suffers um, education suffers for the benefit of 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 the research so so that is that's personally my view mm -hmm. that would be controversial amongst some of my colleagues um but the, I, I agree with the, with the sentiment that, as you just put it, um, it's perverse with respect to the students, but not with respect to the research. Now, universities are playing a, they're, they're playing a very particular game. So universities around the world have been utterly obsessed with rankings for, in particular, the last 10 years. Rankings have been around for longer than that. There are all these different ranking systems. And, you know, every time Monash lifts in the rankings they put it all over their social media it's all over everything There's i think there was just recently a, what they made a they made an announcement about their number one in the world for pharmacology yeah now yeah. now these they, rankings they, this is an important point these rankings are these for the research output or are they for how students perform and like where 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 does that what metric is it that's um accounting yeah. for that yeah, so there's a matrix of metrics, and that's why I say there's all all sorts of different ranking systems, and they weight these things differently. But I'm not aware of a single one where education is contributing up to fifty percent of that weighting. And Cause that's that's the misleading. That then that's I think actually think that's very misleading. I think when people see these rankings and they say number one in the world for pharmacology, they think. Oh wow, that might mean that's a great place to go and study pharmacology, and to also whilst also being at a university and to take in all of what it means to be at a university and benefit from that or suffer from that. And it's not that's not it's not really a, at least for the majority it's not about the students. It's it it's misleading in that that's what well, we're just talking about what our. Um, our researchers behind closed doors do not not how they then deliver that content to you, you students. It's just what they're off doing. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's pretty hard for me to argue against that. Now, for what it's worth, I will throw in one caveat, and that is that education in the Faculty of Pharmacy at Monash University is actually really fantastic. They've had a really um, innovative and positive attitude towards improving their education for, for at least a decade with some fantastic leadership at the highest level. So I will say that, but in, okay. in that particular example, they are actually doing some great stuff in education as well. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I call out people like uh, um, Elizabeth Uriev, Laurence Orlando, and the leadership coming from people like Paul White. So I'll just throw that out there. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. Um, so they'll weight things like are there any Nobel Prize laureates at the institution? Um, how many citations are the papers that get published by academics at that institution? How many citations have they had in the last 12 months? Uh, and these sorts of things. And education is measured very differently. And it's even things like, you know, the educator to student ratio and things like that. Um, but, you know, one ranking system will have that and one won't. So it, it's it's... It's a messy thing, but it's very research focused. But what's fascinating, utterly fascinating, because we haven't talked about the international student cash cow thing yet. I'm not sure if that was on your agenda for discussion, but it you know, wasn't. The, the, we can, if you want to, if you want to touch on that, because we're all on. Well, we'll touch on it now because 
yeah, so I mean, pre-COVID, you know, we had this, you know, just particularly in Australia, but you know, most Western countries, you know, just droves and droves of students coming from other countries around the world. So from the middle class of places like, um, well, in particular, China and India, but you know, right across Asia and, and other parts of the world, coming to Australia, paying extraordinarily large amounts of money to be a student. They have to pay up front. Um, they're paying Ridiculous you know, in amounts, Australian dollars, 40, 45,000 bucks a year. Yeah. Um, so a whole degree is going to cost you $150,000. actually outrageous. You know, for a three-year degree. It's, yeah, it's outrageous. I think that's... It, it, it's gobsmacking. And, 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 and there were many, 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 many thousands of them coming to every institution a- across the country. So COVID kind of, you know, um, curtailed that somewhat, although the growth didn't completely disappear and the growth is coming back. But, but the point I was going to make is it's amazing how much those rankings that we were just lamenting drive student enrollments. So they do, the students just, they follow the rankings. So the, the, the so Monash has no control over that. That's just international student enrollment behaviour. They follow the rankings. So not just Monash, every Australian university has been chasing rankings now fervently for over a decade because it was it was driving the income, the teaching you know, international student teaching revenue that was paying for all of the great research that we want to do. So you can see how it's, it's become a little bit of a vicious circle. Um, and, and, and so it's quite the dilemma. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, and part of this, I suppose, with this rankings thing is that people are drawn to rankings, students, families of students obviously because oh high ranking that means you're going to get a great education and you're going to be able to do very well there but we've there's a bit of a maybe then a paradox in, in what we've been discussing in that from your experience with graduate this graduate employability work and maybe and perhaps jason's experience with um and maybe even just a little bit my own experience is that the capacity the ability to fill your hard drive <laughs> at university and isn't what that isn't that that factor isn't necessarily as important and and ultimately fulfilling and rewarding and necessary as perhaps some of these other things that we've that we've been discussing um at a university and that is plenty you'd be able to find plenty of examples of people who maybe haven't done as well at university but they've had some kind of other extracurricular experience or they've got some aspect of their character or they've got some of these other skills that are developed that make them infinitely more desirable than someone who's just like really good at doing this few select kind of tasks within this brief in this sort of semi-niche realm of of knowledge and so i think that's a that's an important point to to consider because for me at least university really should be about for what it is, what you pay for, what it's made out to be and what it represents, a place to really build your general sort of competence, um, your intellectual competence, but then the competence of your character and the strength of your character and perhaps a sense of identity um, as well. And it should explore the potential of sort of mindset mindset, and integrate these ideas of present and 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 future and should teach you to learn to pay attention to to certain things and that's just that that doesn't seem to really be the case for a lot of people and i think depending on who you talk to is you know there's a bit of a meaning a meaning crisis in society at the moment so some if you go back to like this this is at least just for in america but if you go back to like the 60s uh, 70s and you asked young people, university students, how important it was for them to have or whether or the, whether they did have this thing to have a personal, a meaningful personal philosophy, you'd get 60 to 70% agreeing or saying yes. And now you ask that question now, people wouldn't know what you're talking about or think you're just talking some some weird some weird nonsense like what's that got to do with employment and um career progression and whatnot it's it's dropped to like 30 or or 40 percent and you get 
and so you get students leaving and entering universities in this sort of state of of fog and 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 semi depression and you get more and more so these um these students who fall in when we're talking about categories of students and teaching and receptivity in terms of those who already have sort of some set of value and identity figured out and so are receptive very receptive to the learning and versus those who aren't and don't really know why they're there beyond the fact that what else are they going to do and that's that's sort of the social within the social contract if you're not going to be a tradesman that's sort of what and you want to have some kind of social esteem for better or worse you know that's a whole discussion in and of itself of whether the social esteem awarded supposedly awarded by having a university degree is warranted or not um then that's what you do but then you get there and it's like well shit what am i what am i doing so for the maybe one of the few last questions here is for those that aren't in love with a course and for those that don't have this sense of identity developed and aren't passionate and have to frankly have to find their adventure and some form of meaning and reward and positive emotion in things like drinking and partying if even that like what do you what do you do with those people how do you how do you how do you reach those people is it do you think through at least in some part something like through what jason did or does it have to be purely extracurricular is there some kind of something outside of university that needs to change or do you think that there's something really within university that we can we can do there well i mean i look so let's just focus on the university's responsibilities um and i think you know so, you know society has to respond in its own way but you know it, it will do that in um in, in its own sort of natural way i i think I mentioned earlier that we sort of almost had this, historically we had this chasm between well, what was considered to be in curriculum and what should be extracurricular and that we have been trying to break that down. So, for example, an internship or work experience, they were considered to be extracurricular things. Now, um, and that's not, in every, that's not in every discipline. I mean, think about a teacher education, for example. Well, there's been no teacher education where we haven't been placing student teachers in schools for, since forever, you know, we, we believe in them having authentic experiences so that they can connect their university, what they're learning at university to, to their identity, their professional identity and their prospective career direction. We don't do that in every discipline, but we've been starting to do that more and more. Um, and I, I think that has to keep shifting. You know, if, if I think about the pure sciences, uh, and I was associate dean for the last six years, you know, um, I won't point fingers at any particular discipline. I'll just say there were some disciplines that just, that, that, that didn't think that a focus on employability and authentic real life experiences such, such as work placements belonged in the curriculum. You know, their job was to teach their discipline and then students would take their knowledge and take what they've learned and then apply that by doing an internship over the summer, uh, through volunteering, you know, maybe um, uh, these sorts of things. The shift has just been too slow and and so that, that has got to accelerate. And I'm, I don't want to make this podcast episode all about Monash, but I can assure you that at the highest level of the university, there's a huge push for what we've been calling rich experiences. They've, they've got to be more rich experiences and better rich experiences. Bit of a buzzword, rich experiences. But it's about, you know, authentic experiences where students are, first of all, um, working in a real-life situation, working with students who are in completely different courses. You know, we're actually really well-primed at, at Monash University to do that. Every second student's doing a double degree, like the one that you did and like the one I did 20 years ago. You know, science and economics, you know, science and arts. But wh why don't we actually have students from different courses working with each other more often? You know, then they're really working on some cool problems, delivering all these different skills, the broad skill sets to actually solve problems. And I don't mean contrived algorithmic problems, real problems, problems that no one's actually solved yet, problems that have been given to the university by a company, by industry. So as simple partner. as just sharing knowledge, different ways of thinking, different principles, mm -hmm. different like a science student teaching 
a business student or an art student how to be um, empirical and dispassionate um, mm. and and objective insofar as they actually understand and re- those principles and can practice them um, themselves. And then perhaps mm. these other disciplines being able to uh, do do the same for 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 these for science students, for example. Something along those lines. Yeah, the art student telling the science student why that was completely unethical, what they just proposed, for example. Yeah, um, bullying them with I, their moral t- moral toolkit. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, absolutely. That. So, so th- there's got to be more of that. You know, we, we have this amazing student body, um, and at the moment, it feels a little bit like we're still relying on students to use their own. Um, their own energy to go out and find those experiences for themselves. Now, we, you know, we're often talking about 18, 19 and 20 year olds. They're still living with mum and dad. They may, they may not have the, the maturity, the courage, the confidence to go out and find those experiences for themselves. You know, I know they're young adults, sure, but, but, but they're young. Okay. And you to know, be self-aware and, so- and to, to begin to even to be self-aware and think about these things, because why would you start to think about, say, sense of self, values, identity, meaning, future in a more in a in a today how today relates to tomorrow and next week and next year, and five years from now um, to to sort of think of that beyond this vague abstraction of employment and getting a job, not even really having a career, just just um, getting a job because you sort of you can. If you're exposed to the right experience, like you're saying, and the right people, um, and perhaps depending on your personality, you can sort of have these apprehensions yourself. But you, my God, you, could you benefit from having these, having had, having these discussions had by these adults who could offer, have, are hopefully at least mildly thoughtful and self-aware themselves, and can see students as the young developing um vulnerable people that they are um and not just as these sponges to soak up this information um for an hour or two hour long period and to and to kind of and to actually be mentors and to to, to deliver that in the sense of how you've been for many people and how jason has also been um been for many people perhaps integrating somehow teaching or just instilling this philosophy within within the, within faculty all kinds of faculty that like insofar as any member is capable of um trying to trying to bring these aspects to bear in some sense within curriculum and then then maybe that's where a slight structural change needs to be made within curriculums to 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 support to give a little bit of space for these things um, so it's not all purely at the volition of the lecturer and it, and it, that you're not constrained by having an hour and that needs to be purely content and, then, you know, see you later. Yes, completely agree with everything you just said. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, okay. So we're, we're getting pretty, um, pretty well in here and I think we've, We've covered a lot of sort of what I wanted to cover, and we've probably gone over some things a, um, a few times, which has probably been good to sort of maybe rehash some ideas. And I hope we've been relatively succinct and 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 clear in the messages we've been trying to put out there. And I suppose maybe to wrap up, um, and I'll give my own version of perhaps a quick version of this answer myself. But so, what advice would you give to any uni students listening right now, what do you think is worth is worth is worth sharing in this space that isn't just you know constrained by the requirements of of a lecture? So, so first thing is, you, you know, if I'm if I'm giving advice to to a student, um, you're not going to be at uni forever. So, what the hell are you going to do when you're out the door? Like, what what happens next? And how how are you prepared for that? So there's what you, there's there's the university's responsibility, 
And we've, just, we've talked a lot about that in the last hour and a half, about what university's responsibility is for curating that experience and opening doors. And But, you know, you can't make students walk through doors. You can open doors for them, but you can't, you can't force them to walk through particular doors and that's their own that's their own journey they need to they need to think about where this is going they've signed up to this course you know if they're a domestic australian student they're paying hex or if they're an international student they're actually paying up front 40,000 bucks a year so where where is this going and that and they actually should be thinking about that from first year onwards over the years i reckon every every second final year student I speak to still doesn't know where it's going, let alone a first year student. And I actually think that's got to be a huge shift. And and we're the shepherds, you know, so the university has got to has got to adjust the experience. And the Faculty of Arts, I reckon they're ahead of the curve. So they've had what's called the Global uh, Immersion Guarantee, where in every, uh, every single art student has the opportunity to have an international experience, not, not in their final year, they do it at the end of their first year, and they did that really deliberately. This was this was about, and we got students. They're, they're going to Malaysia. They're going to India. Um, a few students get to go to the Prato conf- uh, campus over in Italy, but most yeah, of them I think are that's going a brilliant, to brilliant, brilliant thing brilliant to do. They're going to a de- developing country. They're working with students um, on real projects, real. They, you know, they're curated, then they're a little bit contrived, but they're still real. And you know, I mean, many of these students. You know they're still nineteen years old, and you know they they're going away, um, having to work effectively in teams of other students. They, they, there's no chance to go over there and have a holiday. When they get there, they've got to do the stuff, you know. And there'll be time to have for them to have fun. I think they're ahead of the curve. Um, but but going back to focusing on the student. So where, where is this all going? So if you are an art student, I've had this amazing opportunity to go to India and work on this project in a developing community and we're going to deliver this for them and so on. But what's the point of this? Why am I doing this? How is this helping me shape my professional identity? How is it helping to shape my values? Because in two or three years from now, I'm actually going to be out there on the job market. I'm going to be going for a job. There's going to be 50 other people applying for the same job, first of all, how do I even get the job interview, which might be one in every 10 applicants? Mm-hmm. And there's how only one speak? job, so then I'm... How do you speak? How that's, do you speak? That's, how do you speak? Well, yeah, that's probably a topic we haven't we haven't covered enough, but maybe that's for another day. But um, how, how, do, how do you speak? How do you present your thoughts and your emotions and your values to somebody else? Um, it, it doesn't matter what the university um, delivers, you're still an individual. You have to have a concept of that. Um, and as I say, I talk over the years. I've spoken to a lot of final year students who still have no idea about that. So you know, you're an adult now. You've got to be working on that, um, not just in your final year, but all the way through. Um, and I think every student has earned the right to go to the beach over the summer because you've been working hard throughout the year. But maybe just don't spend three months bumming around doing nothing as well. You know, that's that's a quarter of the year. You should be you, you should be creating experiences for yourself. And it might be within the university framework, it might be outside of the university framework. It's amazing how much employers, for example, value people who have done volunteering. You know, it's often seen as a bit of an add-on of oh, volunteering. No, super valuable because you're actually um, you're signposting your values as a person when you say well i've actually done this volunteering gig here in fact over the course of my degree i did four different volunteering gigs for these four different organizations a couple of not-for-profits one of them was just volunteering here there or whatever you're actually signposting your values as an individual to a prospective employer so that 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 stuff is super important for every single student out there yeah, that's um, that's fantastic. I I think you really really summarised things beautifully beautifully there and provided some, um, some great advice. To add on and to add on to what you're saying, I would the advice that and that I would give, which is very much in line with yours, is to to start paying attention, to start paying attention, not only as soon as you enter university. You know, there's this. This is prevalent 
idea amongst us young students and even amongst the people who are a bit older where and it's really quite cynical i think actually where it's like well you're still young don't worry about figuring your shit out don't worry about getting yourself together don't worry about responsibility and consequence really because like whatever just chill out like you're young you've got time because fundamentally because hey, once you get a bit older, you're going to have to start working and then life is really going to be this whole other constrained, restricted, um, um, colorless thing. And then you can sort of, that's when you can start worrying about worrying about things and life becomes gray and serious. And that is a, and that's, that is a, 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 a self-enforcing view, I think, that really just serves to make that perception a reality. Um, and so what my advice would be, to students and to young people is to start paying attention, start paying attention to yourself, start paying attention to who it is that you think you are, what it is that you think you value, what it is that you think is important to you, um, what it is that you find meaningful, what it is you get reward from, what it is that you do poorly, what it is that you do well, where things in your life are are lacking and perhaps and where things are going are going are going well start to form some kind of conception functional pragmatic conception of your identity because that's going to and your place in the world and perhaps also what your place in the world in the future could be because that is going to have enormous consequences almost all it 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 might make you have to grow up a little bit but, you know, I think there's actually nothing wrong with growing up um, at, an, at starting to grow up at an age of 19, 20. I think it's actually absolutely essential. And if anything provides you with a sense of certainty in life, because you know a little bit about who you are, you know a little bit of, about why you're doing what it is that you're doing. Maybe you've got some reasons for that now. Maybe they align with your values and maybe you know how that's going to affect what's that's going to result in the future so maybe you've got a bit of direction so maybe you've got some goals that you can aim at and maybe you can start to experience this incentive reward from positive emotion from moving towards those those goals however sort of material or kind of abstracted they might be and because and that gives you strength of character and that allows you to operate and actually act in 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 the world and to be taken seriously and to take yourself seriously and to begin to build competence and because like you said you're not going to be at university forever so when you're at university you have the benefit of being your identity is basically that of a you're a student you're a student and so when a student identity broadly speaking is something that is favorably looked upon in society and by others you get all these concessions you tell someone you're a student at your university and they think oh that's pretty you know that's pretty good um and you can kind of and you know what it is roughly that you have to do from year to year you have to you do this degree you you take this course you do the next course you progress you learn you do your exams you succeed or you fail and then you come back again that gives you this nice direction in life you don't have to think about things too much and then you finish university and suddenly you don't have all this structuring in your life. You don't have all these things that you can do and which maybe gave you some reward from fulfilling and succeeding and, and completing. Suddenly you don't have, you're not a university student anymore. You're a nobody that doesn't have a job and isn't doing anything with themselves. And probably because you didn't develop yourself in university or, or you made life too difficult or life was too difficult to do anything extracurricular, you probably don't have any hobbies. You maybe aren't a very intellectually or emotionally well-rounded person. And so you're left kind of suddenly, you're on this pedestal and now you're suddenly in the dirt and now you've got to pick yourself up again and somehow find and want people, people want, people want to employ you, have people want to employ you. And then you've got to start figuring all these, all these things out as well. And it, like, it's, it's very easy to, you, you, you can just drop off. Um, but if you've, and that can be depressing and anxiety inducing, you know, it can really do things for your self-esteem if you can't get a job or you don't have any sense of self or certainty or that can, can buffer you in say tough times. So to, to build on what you were saying, I would, the sort of the simple, in the simplest form, just start to pay 
attention. Start to take yourself seriously. Start to take the world a little bit serious, a little bit more seriously. Um, and and pay attention. So, um, I think that probably. I'm I'm not sure what you have to what you would think about that, but I think that ties nicely as well into and add, adds on to what. Oh, look, I think everything you said was extremely well put. And the only thing I would add to it is, you know, if you were if you were listening to this podcast right now and you were listening to what Lucian was just saying and you think, well, I don't have the answers to some of those questions, go and look for them. Don't sit on your bum. Just go and look for them. They're out there somewhere. The answers are out there. Well, um, an hour, 50 minutes. I think that was a, that was a fantastic conversation, Chris. Um, thanks so much. It's, I haven't had the opportunity to, um, usually only talk about these things with Jason two or three times a year on a, on a, on a phone call since leaving uni and he's been away for a while and I haven't had the chance to think about these things for a while with work and, um, whatnot, but they're very interesting topics. I think they're very important and very rewarding to, to go, to go over. So, um, thanks a lot for sharing. And it was great to finally have a proper, proper conversation on these, on these, on these issues. It's something that I've actually been thinking about for quite a while and that would be quite, quite rewarding. Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity. It was great to chat and great to, to, to spend some time on the, on your, your nascent podcast. And I hope, um, it, there'll be yeah. many more episodes for me to, um, watch and listen to beyond this one yeah i hope so i hope so too we'll see we'll see how we go you're the lucky lucky number two so you you'll sit there in that hopefully one day hall of fame <laughs> early entry all right keep in touch cheers